My name is Eric Ryder. I'm the Education Specialist for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. Uh, and today we are uh, bringing up uh, back another, another one of our book talks. Uh, today we're going to be talking with Mr. Mark Trapp, uh, whose uh, newest work, Kiffin Rockwell and the Boys Who Remembered Lafayette, A Destiny of Undying Greatness, uh, is going to look at the Lafayette Escadrille. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to say a quick thank you to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation and to uh, its executive director, Ms. Jennifer Carlson. They do a fantastic job of supporting us and providing all these free programs that we are allowed to put out there in the interwebs uh, for everybody. Uh, not only our book talks, but also our curator conversations, um, our, our drink and draw nights, our trivia nights, our movie discussion nights. Uh, we've got a lot of virtual events out there and you can always find them on wisbetsmuseum.com under the event section. And they're always free. So we highly encourage everybody out there to please attend more of our events. And I would also just like to say a quick thank you to Generac Power System uh, for their continued support as a sponsor of our programming as well. So thank you very much to Generac Power Systems. Uh, so like I said, today's uh, author is Mr. Mark Trapp. Uh, Mark is a lawyer in Chicago and he first encountered the name uh, Kiffin Rockwell on his very first day on campus at Washington and Lee University uh, when he came across a plaque honoring Rock Rockwell. Uh, this really intrigued him, so he began to learn more about this character and what led him to France uh, three years before America entered the First World War. Um, and many years later, Mark, Mark's interest was rekindled in this topic uh, due to his son's birthday on the 100th anniversary of Kiffin's reenlistment into the French Foreign Legion. Uh, so this really set Mark on a five-year research endeavor, uh, which ultimately led to this work that he's produced. Um, and so we're really thankful to have him here uh, talking with us today. Uh, Mark, I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to you, uh, and please let us know all about this. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, Jen. Thanks, Molly. Uh, thanks to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. I really appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to speak to you. I'm glad that there are people that are signed up and that are interested in this topic, because it's what, uh, what, what I've come to like most of all, is to, is to speak about Kiffin Rockwell and, as I call them, the boys who remembered Lafayette. We'll touch a little bit on that uh, theme as I work through uh, a few of the slides. The book is a rather long book, and so it's kind of hard to pare down to just a few things. And um, I tried to do my best. Uh, I, I, I'm glad to see that there are people that are interested in, the, in, in this topic. I was one of the many Americans um, who didn't know much about World War I and uh, our role in it until uh, I encountered the name Kiffin Rockwell and then started doing some research, uh, as Eric indicated. But let's, uh, let's start there. Um, this first slide I thought might be kind of, kind of interesting to, to, to discuss. This is from a YouGov.com poll in 2014 in July. So it was the uh, uh, 100 year anniversary of the outbreak of, uh, of war. At the end of July, many of you may know that uh, Austria-Hungary declared war on, on Serbia on July 28th. Then uh, the dominoes fell shortly after that. And as Eric mentioned, my son, who I named Kiffin, uh, was born in August of 2014. So this poll came out right around then and it asked this question, did the United States have a responsibility to fight in World War I? And you can see the results there, 46% uh, said yes, America did have a responsibility. 21% or one in five said no, America did not. And one third were not sure. Um, in 2014, I probably would have been in the, yeah, we had a responsibility, but I wouldn't really have known why or much behind that. Now I hope to talk a little bit about that word uh, responsibility, because I think it's kind of at the heart of, of um, my book. A um, hundred years before this poll, in August of, of 2014, I think the results would have been much different. I think most Americans, uh, certainly a, a majority, would have felt that uh, we did not have any responsibility uh, to fight in, in World War I. Um, in, in that month, in, in August 2014, when uh, iron fire and death were about to sweep across the European continent, most Americans, I think, were of the mindset that uh, maybe there was cause for alarm, but you, you don't need to be unreasonably alarmed. And a European war seemed like a terrible affair, but um, 
surely the parties would come to their senses before things got too far out of hand. Nobody imagined that this, the, the initial puffing would, would draw in millions uh, of soldiers and cause millions of, of uh, casualties. Um, most people at that time, I think, would have felt like uh, all the squabbling over the death of one uh, measly archduke was um, not worth too getting worked up about. Um, but there were a, a, a few on the other side of the, uh, of, of the fence who felt that, yes, we did have a responsibility. And they largely tied that to um, the actions of uh, Lafayette, the Marquis de Lafayette, who had come to help America in America's time of need during the, the Revolutionary War and had come and brought some uh, friends with him and money and outfitted with troops and, and uh, had a big impact on America's war for, in, for independence. And back in, um, in that time, in, in 1914, uh, most Americans uh, still viewed uh, Lafayette as on a par with uh, the Founding Fathers. And I guess I should mention at that time, most viewed the Founding Fathers as the good guys, uh, which uh, is, is not the case with, with everybody um, today, unfortunately. Um, what do people know about World War I and what did I know um, when, when, when I first started writing the book? I knew a little bit about Kiffin Rockwell and I'll tell a, a little bit more about, you know, Eric mentioned how, how I uh, was prompted to write this book. I'll explain a little bit more about that and how this sort of came about. Um, but I didn't know much about World War I and I would have put myself in the, in the category of an American who didn't know uh, too much uh, about the war. And unfortunately, many, many Americans don't. Um, I, the, the, to the extent that I, that I knew much, I knew sort of the time frame. I knew President Wilson was, was president. I had heard this phrase, Lafayette, we are here. And I knew, I knew that had something to do with it and that maybe there was this obligation to Lafayette. Um, as most of you probably know, that phrase stems from a speech given on the 4th of July in 1917. Uh, in, at the tomb of Lafayette in Paris, France, where Colonel Charles Stanton, who was an aide to John J. Pershing, um, uh, gave, gave a, a, a famous speech and uh, uttered that line, uh, Lafayette, we are, we are here. He, uh, the American troops that were officially welcomed into Paris and France that day, and they had big, huge uh, demonstrations, and I'll, I'll touch back on that later in the, in the uh, talk. But here's what... Um, uh, Charles Stanton said that day on the 4th of July, 1917, at the tomb of Lafayette. America has joined forces with the Allied powers and what we have of blood and treasure are yours. Therefore, it is with loving pride we drape the colors and tribute of respect to this citizen of your great republic. And here and now, in the shadow of the illustrious dead, we pledge our heart and our honor in carrying this war to successful issue. Lafayette, we are here. And that phrase, Lafayette, we are here, I think harkens to that uh, word that I touched on at the beginning, responsibility. I think by July 4th, 1917, many Americans had felt this uh, idea that we did have a responsibility. And as you can see from this poll, still half of uh, America thinks we had a responsibility 100 years later. And Kiffin Rockwell and the other boys who remembered Lafayette would be proud that at least half of America still feels, still feels that. Let's go back 100 years to August of 1914. And like I said, in, 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 in August of 1914, a good chunk of the, um, of the American public would have been against us having a responsibility to fight in World War I. Well, this is a, a headline from page five of the Atlantic Journal on August 4th, 1914. And uh, I'll, I'll just read, read part of that to you. See, it says, three young Atlanteans would shoulder arms in defense of France. Paul Rockwell, his brother K.Y. Rockwell, which is uh, Kiffin Yates Rockwell, and their friend R.L. Mock, three young men of Atlanta, have telegraphed to the French consul in New Orleans offering to enlist as soldiers of France in the war against Germany. Now, if you know uh, anything about World War I, you know that the war had just broken out. I think war was declared on August 2nd. Uh, there was some uh, incursions there on August 3rd, and this was just reported. So here it is on August 4th in Atlanta, 
that this is this is being reported and you can see that there was at least two uh, young Americans who had decided that they did have a responsibility and they had even telegraphed the French consul in New Orleans to offer to enlist uh, to help France. That was Paul and Kiffin Rockwell who were brothers and I'd love to tell you all, uh, all about them. Uh, Kiffin is the primary vehicle through, uh, through which I tell the story of World War I in my book and I go into some detail about his family and ancestry and all of that. But uh, we won't have time to touch too much on that today. But just um, um, know that the, these guys stood up right at the beginning of the war and said, we need to help France. We have an obligation. Um, they were brought up to see Lafayette as an important figure. They were brought up to, to uh, be proud of their ancestors who had fought in wars previously. And they felt that we, we owed this debt. Um, Paul once said uh, that he had learned as soon as I could read to be grateful to France and to Lafayette and his French comrades. And since these were boys of principle, they decided that uh, when, the, when war broke out, they were gonna act on that principle and help um, France. Um, interesting, you know, I, I, I said two boys and you're probably saying, well, your own slide says three young Atlanteans. Uh, why are you only saying two? Well, this, this R.L. Mock was, uh, was a reporter friend of uh, Paul Rockwell's, and Paul was, was working as a reporter at the Atlanta Constitution uh, at that time. And Paul la later said about Mock here, uh, th th this quote, he said, R.L. Mock was one of the big talkers that we encounter in life. He evidently thought Kiffin and I were discussing volunteering to fight for France just to be talking, and he was all for going with us. When he found out that we were in our earnest, he dropped out of the picture. <laughs> and so uh, that's also indicative of a lot of the mindset of America at that time, that um, they just didn't think it was worth uh, uh, bothering with a, a European war. Um, but Kiffin and Paul uh, obviously did. And they, they were probably uh, the first Americans to leave uh, American shores to go and um, fight in, uh, in, in France. Now, interestingly, this very same edition of the Atlanta Journal, this August 4th, 1914 edition, had on page one, uh, you know, many of the war headlines and things. And one of the articles uh, was titled, Wilson Proclaims Neutrality of U.S. During Great War. So uh, a couple interesting things about that. It was already being called a great war, you know, the day after it, it, it broke out. And Wilson, that's a reference to President Wilson, obviously. President Wilson proclaims neutrality of U.S. Well, you, you see that uh, Paul and Kiffin were not much for neutrality, and in the same edition of that paper, um, reported that they had already telegraphed the French consul, and, and they had, and uh, there's some interesting stuff about that in my book, too. I actually tracked down that actual telegram, and it actually exists, and they really did do that. It wasn't uh, some, ma some made-up story. Well, President Wilson, though, was speaking on behalf of the majority of Americans when he was declaring that neutrality. And uh, uh, just two weeks after this, on August 19th, he appeared before Congress and he said uh, this in furtherance uh, of, of his previously proclaimed policy, which uh, forbid Americans from enlisting or entering into the service of either of the said belligerents. Now that was reference to France and Germany. So they were prohibited from the beginning. And then he said this on August 19th, the United States must be neutral in fact, as well as in name during these days that are to try men's souls. We must be impartial in thought as well as in action, must put a curb upon our sentiments, as well as upon every transaction that might be construed as a preference of one party to the struggle before another. Well, Kiffin and Paul were not having any of that and they preferred France over Germany and that's where they were, uh, that's where they were headed. So they bought uh, some tickets on, a, on the last ocean liner that was leaving American shores for some time. And they uh, took that boat across the Atlantic. And by the end of August, they were in uh, Paris. Now, let me tell you just a little bit about uh, Kiffin. And, th and this is just a little bit about how I became aware of him and, and this story. That's a picture of him there on the left. And that's a picture of when he was 17 years old and was enrolled at Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia. In 1997, I began law school at Washington and Lee University School of Law uh, there in Lexington. And my first day on campus, I went walking around and uh, 
made my way into Lee Chapel, which is right there on, on campus. That's where Robert E. Lee was buried and some of his family and his horse, <laughs> all kinds of things like that. Um, it's a pretty impressive campus and a pretty uh, cool chapel. Well, as I was walking around, I came across this plaque that's on the wall. And you can see there it says Kiffin Yates Rockwell, uh, Lieutenant Lafayette Escadrille, French Army, killed in aerial combat over Rotor and Alsace, September 23rd, 1916. And I thought, um, wow, that's, uh, th that's a really cool name. You know, at, at, at that time, my wife was pregnant with our first uh, um, daughter. And we didn't know whether it was a daughter or a son at that time. But um, so we were thinking of baby names. And I came across that name on the wall. And I thought, Kiffin Yates Rockwell. Holy moly, that's a cool name. That's, uh, that might be the coolest name I've ever heard. This guy must have been something special. And um, so anyway, I, but, but I thought uh, as well, September 23rd, 1916, and again, you know, like I said, I didn't know a ton about World War I, but I thought, wait, I thought we didn't get in World War I until 1917. What is this guy doing in France? What's he doing in the French army? What's he doing uh, dying in aerial combat? And um, so I, I was uh, struck by all that and started doing just a little bit of um, poking around. And you could find his letters were published by his brother. And a few other things that uh, that led me to believe that this was a man of some uh, importance. So I always uh, thought that uh, that if we ever had a son, we we, we might name him Kiffin after I learned more uh, about Kiffin. And eventually, as Eric indicated, we we did, and that sort of rekindled my interest um, in uh, Kiffin and and then the boys. And so I started doing research, and I learned a whole lot more about them and you can read all about it in my book. But I really think that the book tells the story of how America entered into World War I. And as I indicated with that poll on the first slide, I think most Americans came around to the view by the time we got into the war that it was our responsibility. And I think that a lot of that shift in public opinion took place because of the actions of Kiffin and these other boys that you can read about in the, in the book. Here's a few of the others. This is, so I told you Kiffin and Paul made their way across the Atlantic. They stopped in London and then they took a boat over to Paris. And when they arrived in Paris, it was August 26th, 1914. And this photo was running in the New York Herald, which was the English language paper in Paris. This photo was running that day in the, in the New York Herald. You can see it's dated August 25th because it was taken obviously the day before. So on August 25th of 1914, the day before Kiffin and Paul arrived, this was what one of the things that had happened in Paris and somebody snapped a photo of it. It's a picture of uh, what, the, what was captioned, the departure of the American volunteers. And when war broke out uh, uh, at, the be at the beginning of August, there were a lot of uh, different men of different nationalities in Paris, and, and a lot of people wanted to uh, sign up and help France. And so a lot of the different countries started their own um, sort of volunteer corps, uh, corps is what, what they called them. And um, there were some American businessmen and there were a lot of students there uh, living in the Latin Quarter, um, going to uh, schools in Paris of architecture and art and things like that. Um, and they started their own American Volunteer Corps. And uh, this is the departure of them, that they had begun training uh, there in Paris. They got together and started running drills and they were recruiting other people and saying, hey, America owes a debt to France. Uh, you, you need to come and help us out, you, you Americans, we owe France. And so they got a pretty good group um, there together and they bought themselves a flag. And you can see that flag there that they're carrying. And they, uh, th this was the day that they were actually set to enlist because France set a rule that said that uh, foreign troops, which the Americans obviously were, could not enlist until 20 days after the French had marshaled all their own forces. So by uh, August 25th, uh, they started taking in some of these other um, uh, nationalities into the foreign legion, the French foreign legion. And that's where all these men were marching to the train station to go um, they, they had enlisted the two days before with the French Foreign Legion officially enlisted, and now they were going to the train station to depart for their training. So when Kiffin and Paul arrived in Paris, this was what was going on, and they must have been super excited 
to uh, learn about this. And they ran right down there to that office and signed up themselves. That flag that they're carrying, I said, was one that they bought and hung over their recruiting offices in Paris. And now you can see they were carrying it down the Avenue de la Opera towards the, um, towards the train station. That flag only had uh, uh, 44 stars on it, even though there were um, 48 in the, in, the, in the United States at that time. But they, um, that was the best flag they could get on short notice. And so that's what they were using. And it had hung over their offices. Now they were carrying it down the, the Avenue de la Opera and they took it with them uh, to the front. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as well. But first I wanna to touch on just a couple of these volunteers. You can see there in the front, the guy that's carrying the flag. I don't know this with 100% certainty, but I'm pretty sure that uh, you know his, his head is turned and you can't see for sure. I think that's a, a gentleman named uh, Rene Felizo. And then the guy right behind him, you can see he sort of got his cheeks sucked in there with a nice uh, derby hat. He's, he's sort of like that and got this uh, stride to him. That's Alan Seeger. And some of you may, may know that name and say, Alan Seeger, wait a second, I feel like I know that. And I'll touch a little bit on him too. Um, but this, uh, you know, Alan Seeger, you might know because he wrote uh, the poem that, that's probably most famous poem uh, most famous American poem, anyway, from the World War I era, I Have a Rendezvous with Death. And I wish I could tell you the whole story about uh, that. You can read that in my book, too. But I think that that story actually comes from uh, a night that, that Alan Seeger spent at the, uh, at the front by this uh, barricade with Kiffin Rockwell. Just he and Kiffin Rockwell were on guard duty at this bombed-out chateau and they nearly died when they got overrun by a patrol of Germans. And uh, as you may know, if you know Seeger or know that poem, it begins, I have a rendezvous with death at some disputed barricade. And I think I may be the first person to sort of make the connection to that night that he spent at the, at the bombed out chateau with Kiffin Rockwell as the uh, impetus behind that poem. But that's a heck of a story that's uh, that, that's spelled out in the book. But these characters, th 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 these are just two of the characters that ended up with the American volunteers when they when they got to the front as part of the French Foreign Legion. Alan Seeger was one of them. Uh, this poet from Harvard, and the guy carrying the flag is Rene Felizo, who was um, who was born in France, and uh, his father was the. Um, former editor of a popular journal there, but he was raised mostly here in Chicago where I am on Division Street by his, uh, his Irish mother. Um, and he was quite a character. He, he ran off to uh, um, serve as a cabin boy on a Mississippi River uh, boat when he was 13. And when he was 15, he worked his way across the Atlantic on a steamer that was bound for France. And I came across, uh, when I was doing some research, I actually came across a, a, a record that showed him, listed him as a stowaway on a, uh, on a boat that was coming from Liverpool to Boston when he would have been 19. And so he, he made his way all around the world. He eventually drifted into the, uh, the Congo district, they called it then, in Africa, and became a big game hunter and an ivory uh, trader and made a little uh, name and fortune for himself there. Well, he signed up to defend uh, uh, France there because he, he was in Paris at the outset of the war. And um, that flag that they were carrying, which I said I would touch on, he carried it down there. And then when they got to the front and they finished their training and they were actually going all the way to the front, um, orders came down that uh, all foreign flags had to be discarded. Uh, else any uh, international incidents arise from, you know, other nationalities being involved in the, in the war, such as America, who, as you know, uh, and as I indicated, was uh, declared officially neutral by, by President Wilson. Well, fellas was having none of that, so he didn't turn the flag in. He took the flag and wound it up and then wound it around his waist, and he wore it under his uniform uh, for much of the time that they were at the at, at the front, and he died uh, about six months after the, they they had reached the front in March of um, 1915. He he was uh, the second American to die uh, in, in in the war, and he sat up in the hospital just before his death. And several people confirmed the story, which when I first heard it, I thought, "Wow, that sounds almost unbelievable." But it was in several uh, accounts from from the people that were there. 
and he took this flag. Uh, he, he was half delirious and had, had um, um, you know, he, he was somewhat impaired. He was on the verge of death. And he sat up and took this flag from around his waist and raised it up and said, I am an American. And then, um, and then collapsed and, and then and died. And others in the unit took that flag and then they wore it and they carried it with them through all their battles. And, uh, and um, there's, I'll tell you a little bit more about that towards the, towards the end of the presentation. Um, this is that flag and you can see when, when they, so after they marched through Paris and they, they boarded the trains and they got to their first training point in Rouen, France, um, Kiffin and Paul joined them there because remember I said they showed up uh, the, the, day that, the day after these guys had marched. So Kiffin and Paul signed up, they got on the, uh, the, the, the transport train, they signed up with the Foreign Legion and they were sent out to ruin as well. And they ended up in this unit with, I think there was nine or 10 Americans, uh, quite a group. You can read all about them in the book. They were just a conglomeration of, of really uh, uh, pretty awesome guys and really cool characters from all, all walks of life. And they're thrown in the French Foreign Legion, which already had all walks of life. And they're thrown in with uh, some other nationalities too. In fact, their corporal was a German uh, who, who had been in the French Foreign Legion for, for some time. Um, you can see all these, uh, the writing on the flag. And this is the earliest sort of uh, like a little negative uh, that I found. You can't find any of the other pictures that have uh, any of the, the detail here. And you say, well, detail, that doesn't look like much detail. This is as detailed as, as it gets because most of these uh, signatures and writing have faded out of that flag. And this flag is still on display in Paris. And I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, uh, more too. But on September 1st, when they were still in ruin, um, they, they, they got word that they had to be transferred out of ruin because uh, uh, the word was that Paris was going to fall and that uh, things were really dicey for the French. And so they trucked them out of there. But before they trucked them out of there, uh, Felizot took that flag, uh, Claude René Felizot took that flag and went to all the Americans that were there and said, you know, we're all sort of staking our claim here in France. And we need to sign this flag. And so they all took out these pens and they signed their names on the American flag. And you can see, it says there, you can see on that top stripe, it says American Volunteer Corps, um, uh, Ruin, September 1, 1914. And um, then they, they kept track on the, on the second line of other places that they, that they went and they wrote some of the names of the places where they were stationed. And that first top white, white stripe, they all signed their names on there. You can see a couple of them got, got struck out. And uh, there was some indication in some of the letters and diaries and things that I found that some of the guys who didn't make it or didn't uh, perform as well, they would scratch their name off of there. And there was a couple of guys that, uh, that uh, didn't show as well. But I think most of these guys showed themselves to be heroes and, uh, and those that signed this flag really have a, a claim to fame. And I compiled in my book uh, what I think are most of the guys that signed the flag. And because the signatures are faded, you can't... Uh, say for sure now, but I think I've got about 31 of the people that signed the flag. And out of those 31, there's, there's a huge list of people that deserve to be known as, as heroes. And some of them you would, you would recognize, like Alan Seeger uh, signed, signed the flag. Uh, William Thaw, who became famous as part of the, uh, the Lafayette Escadrille, signed the flag. He was in that squadron with Kiffin. Um, uh, uh, Bert Hall was was also there, and he 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 signed the flag, and he he was a he was quite a character. There's a, and Paul and Kiffin signed the flag, and if you go and see this flag in Paris, France today, about the only signatures that are still visible and that, that didn't fade are uh, Kiffin and Paul Rockwell, and one other uh, uh, an African American guy uh, from from here here in America who who was in Paris as a prize fighter doing uh, boxing and things, and, and he, signed, he, he signed up too and ended up in the squadron. His name was Bob Scanlon. Uh, so qu quite, a, quite a group of people, and they signed this flag, and I think that that's a, a pretty cool thing. And then Felizot wore it around his, his waist. 
we've got to sort of skip through some of all the how all this came about and uh, there's there's some dispute about it from other people who say well the squadron you know the aviation squadron actually came about because of norman prince some people say it's william thaw i think through my research i, I confirmed the idea was norman prince's and people credit some of it to bill thaw um, just because he was there and helped and he was already a pilot but i'm, I'm pretty confident that the uh the the impetus for this and the and the uh, pushing and backing behind it came primarily from Norman Prince. This is a shot of uh, Norman Prince and Elliot Cowden and, and William Thaw, who were the first three pilots. Um, they all won uh, uh, awards in French aviation and they had signed up in French aviation. That Bill Thaw, who's there on the right, was in Kiffin's French Foreign Legion Squadron and was already a pilot before the war started. He was uh, a Yale football player and his, uh, from Pittsburgh, and his father was a big tycoon there, and he came from lots of money and had learned how to fly uh, hydro airplanes. And he was in Paris when the war broke out, and he signed up uh, with the American Volunteer Corps. And they wouldn't take him as a pilot, but they took his plane, and they took him as a private in the, in the Foreign Legion. Well, um, he kept on pushing to become a pilot, and near the end of, the, of 1914, they let him transfer into uh, aviation. Shortly after that was when Norman Prince, who's on the left, now I see the, the, the signatures above these were written down wrong. The, uh, the, the newspaper man who took the photo wrote down that on the left was uh, Elliot Cowden, and in the middle was Norman Prince, but it's, uh, it's flip-flopped. It's actually Norman Prince on the left. And Norman Prince was a Harvard-trained uh, lawyer. He actually worked for a big fancy law firm here in Chicago, uh, Winston uh, and Strawn, which is uh, e even today a global powerhouse law firm, one of the biggest law firms. He worked for the, for the firm here in Chicago, and I tracked down some of his uh, old uh, legal papers and stuff here with his signature on it. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. But he was, he, he, he was trying to be a pilot, too, and it was his idea, so he actually came from America to try to get the French interested in having an all-American squadron. And the French weren't really interested in that. They had enough pilots and they had enough guys uh, that were uh, interested themselves. But there were a couple French officials who took note of it and said, hey, you know what? This might not be a bad thing to have, uh, have some Americans flying for us. You know, we could get some sort of uh, propaganda uh, out of it. And at that time, propaganda didn't have sort of the negative connotation that, that comes with it now. They just thought we, we might be able to use these guys. But there's a lot of bureaucracy in governments and in military, and so things were moving really slow. So mo during most of 1915, there were only a few American pilots that, that the French allowed into their units, and the three primary ones were right here, Norman Prince, Elliot Cowden, and Bill Thaw. And they all won um, the Croix de Guerre. They uh, advanced they were in rank, and they were all officers, and they were doing well. And the American press was picking up on this, and... Uh, and making heroes of these guys back home because there wasn't much of an American angle to the war other than these Americans that were that were over there fighting. Well, around Christmas time of 1915, the French decided to give these three uh, aviators leave to go home for Christmas break. <laughs> you think that's, I mean, it sounds kind of strange. And to me, I was like, what? Uh, but, but, but they did, they let them come home and they came back and they came to New York and they got in on December 23rd and they had eight days of leave uh, and, then they had, and then they had to come back. Well, I think they actually didn't come back until around January 4th, but they were home for just about two weeks. And uh, the press just went wild with these guys. Uh, you, you can see the headline that, that, that I put on here was American aviators back from the Western front. And this photo and a couple other photos that are very similar to this, there must have been a whole gaggle of reporters there on the deck of the, of the uh, Rotterdam, which was the ship that they took back across the Atlantic to get back home. And the reporters must have just been waiting on mass because there was a bunch of photos that look almost exactly like this printed in papers throughout America right around Christmas of 1915. And they all praised these American aviators and these American war eagles. And they had all these names for them and they really lionized these guys in the press and they were heroes all over to, to the point that uh, the the um uh, a, a german uh, american who ran a um a magazine for german americans protested to the state department and filed all these official protests saying 
these Americans are, are violating American neutrality and they need to be uh, in, interned right here in America under the, um, the Hague Convention and, and, uh, and was causing all these problems. And um, I dug up some of the archival uh, uh, stuff behind the scenes that was going on at the State Department as a result of all these complaints. And they actually sent a, a couple agents out to go uh, talk to Bill Thaw and, and figure out, well, what are you doing here? And why, why are you back? They all knew, but America didn't want to get involved in, uh, in, you know, interning these guys here and keeping them here. It, it would have been worse. So um, they ended up letting them leave, and it became a big deal with uh, a lot of the Germans. Were like, you know, there's American pilots flying over there, and you know, America, you're you're, you're not truly neutral. That came into play later on too, and I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that. But by the time these guys came back to France in early 1916, the French really figured out just by following all the press coverage, hey, you know what? <laughs> that, looks pretty, uh, that looks pretty good for us. So all this press over there about how Americans are fighting for France, you know what? We're going to go ahead and form that squadron, that you, the, the American squadron that you've, been that you've been trying to get, Mr. Prince. And so uh, when, when he came back, uh, they were now pushing at an open door and the door opened up and the uh, bureaucracy in France started moving to, to make this squadron. And in the meantime, Kiffin had gotten out of the French Foreign Legion after getting wounded in the trenches. And he had uh, uh, taken aviation training in the fall of 1915. And more and more Americans were getting ad admitted there uh, into aviation. And Kiffin ha had a real knack for it and became a, uh, a, a very good pilot very, very quickly. This was a very romantic type uh, time, and and the notion of these guys flying through the air in these in these planes was was a, a brand new thing too. And so um, there was a there was a lot uh, in the American imagina imagination and in the imagination of those around the world that they saw pilots as sort of you know these these knights of the sky, and and particularly when. Aviation was going through a lot of uh, rapid transformation at this time in the crucible of war. And uh, the planes were, you know, each generation of plane was coming out in just a couple months and, and total upgrades, you know, as far as uh, how, how, to, how they handled and how, how they flew and what their capabilities were. And all this was coming together in early 1916 when the French formed what they called the Escadrille Americaine. Uh, they gave them these new airplanes called Newports, uh, Newport 11, uh, known as the Baby, because it was so small and agile, and uh, and it was really like about the first uh, um, fighter plane. And uh, and these guys, the Americans, were the first squadron to have the whole squadron outfitted in these Newport 11s, and they were so excited. And, and there were seven of them that formed this uh, Escadrille American uh, when, when they came to the front in April of 1916. Let me see if I can find the, advance this. This was a photo, I, I call it the tragic photo and, I, and, and a, lot, a lot of people do and I'll tell you, tell you why. This is shortly after they got to uh, their first station in Luxoy, France, which is in um, Eastern France uh, near the border of Switzerland. The guy in the middle there is George Taino, who was their French uh, captain, but the other four guys are Americans. And remember, I already showed you Norman Prince and Bill Thaw and Elliot Cowden. That was three of the, of the pilots. Uh, there's, there's four here in this photo. Starting from the left is Jim McConnell. Uh, second from the left is Kiffin Rockwell, who's, who, as I said, is sort of um, my favorite in the, in the uh, vehicle through which I tell this whole story. And then to the... Uh, the second from the right there is Norman Prince again, and on the end is Victor Chapman. Um, this is called the tragic photo because all four of, uh, of these guys would eventually uh, die in the service of France. And all four of them died before America entered the war. And to my way of thinking, the, the hullabaloo in the press and the lionizing in the press and just the stories that went on, particularly around their deaths, I think it swayed the American uh, public opinion uh, further in the uh, in the way of intervention on behalf of France, and um, and played a large role in our eventually 
uh, feeling that it was our responsibility. And these boys standing up for their principal, and, and, and they all said, and I found their diaries and their letters and their accounts, and they all said, it is our responsibility, and we owe this because of Lafayette and because of what Fran France did for us. And they knew and assumed that they were going to die, and they were fine with that. And as I mentioned, all four of these uh, boys did die before America even entered the, the war. I did neglect to tell you one, one quote here back when, um, from Norman Prince, when they were leaving the American shores back after their Christmas leave, uh, they had sort of stayed tight-lipped in the press prior to that, but when they got offshore on a ship, one of the reporters asked Norman Prince what were his motives for joining the French. And now that he was off American soil and on his way back to France, he felt more uh, at ease to, to say what he thought, and here's what he said. I enlisted because we in America owe such a debt to France as can never be paid. My country may have forgotten what Lafayette and Rochambeau and all the rest did for us, when we were in dire need, but some of us have not forgotten. And that was sort of the sentiment behind all these guys and um, pretty remarkable group and the, and the things that they did were pretty remarkable. Well, throughout that, um, that summer, after they formed at, at Luxoy and Kiffin Rockwell in May of 1916, shot down a, a, a German plane and um, made worldwide headlines and put, really put the uh, Escadrille American on the map. And, um, and, and, and really, uh, the, the press was going crazy here, here in the United States about the, uh, the, the, these flyboys over there. And the French, you know, I talked about how they saw they, they, they had advantages there. Well, immediately, they sent all these cameras out to Luxoy and filmed all of these guys with their, you know, this, this new thing was coming out around the same time, uh, motion pictures. And so they took a lot of footage of these boys there in their planes and uh, them flying and them walking around smoking constantly. <laughs> they were all big smokers. And, um, and they turned it into a, a movie and they released it in Paris and all around France and it was a huge hit. And then a, uh, a film company in America through, through uh, a former American ambassador got the footage and uh, released it in America that summer of 1916. It debuted in New York on July 5th. And they've released it as a movie called Our American Boys in the European War. And all these, uh, what, would you, what would you call them, elite uh, folks in the, uh, up and down the eastern seaboard here in America, you know, really rich families, sort of the blue, blue blood families, of whom Norman Prince and Victor Chapman and Bill Thaw and Elliot Codden, they came from that sort of uh, uh, background and, and, and breeding, you would say. These elites in, on, in the Eastern Seaboard here in America paid to have that movie sponsored at their estates or at different theaters, and they would use it to raise money for, for um, the war effort in France and to raise awareness. And so not only were these guys pilots and, uh, and talked about in the press, they were now like movie heroes. And uh, this, this, this movie was traveling around the Eastern United States, and these guys were becoming famous, and people were talking about it every, everywhere. Um, and they, when they would put on the movie, they would have people come in and speak about it too, and what was going on in France. And they would have the ambulance drivers and the volunteers come and speak about it. And it went, went some distance towards not only raising money, but raising awareness and changing public opinion. Well, Victor Chapman got shot down in June. He was, he was the first American pilot to go down. They had a big ceremony for him in Paris on the 4th of July. And again, more press, more, uh, more uh, people realizing, hey, you know what? We have Americans dying over there. We, you know, Victor Chapman just gave his life. And Victor Chapman was the son of John J. Chapman, who was a famous author and essayist here in America, and the grandson of John Jay, who was the first uh, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. So again, we're talking blue blood, American and the rest of America is hearing these stories about these, you know, sort of these e elite uh, folks who are giving their lives for France. And it, and it really started changing uh, public opinion. Well, the next one to go down was Kiffin, unfortunately. In September of 1916, he was shot down. He had four victories. He was one short of becoming, a, you know, an official ace. Um, got shot down near the same place where he had brought down his first German, near Luxoy. He is still buried over there and I've been to his grave. He's buried under the American flag and the French flag 
on French soil. It's a pretty um, moving place. And this is a photo, which is also pretty moving. And it's a shot of his brother, Paul, at the actual crash site. That's Bill Thaw there in the background kneeling down. And you can sort of see Paul is just grief stricken. And um, he was devastated by his brother's death, death. And by this time, he had, he had been invalided out of the Foreign Legion for some time. He had become a war correspondent with the Chicago Daily News from Paris and had made a name for himself as, as a correspondent over there because he knew all the boys in the Foreign Legion and in the aviation. And so he got all the dope and uh, would send it back to the papers in America and was making quite a living for, for himself and, um, and uh, spreading the, you know, the, 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 the good word of American intervention in, uh, in, in France. Well, when Kiffin died, it was a big blow to him. And to the squadron, I mean, Kiffin was one of these guys that everybody liked. It really blew uh, Paul away. And you can, it, this photo sort of captures it. And um, so when Kiffin died, there was a big uh, outcry in the press and, and particularly in Germany, because, you know, Germany had stopped its submarine warfare, or at least the, uh, uh, the unrestricted submarine warfare early, earlier that year as part of its Sussex pledge to America, where well, there were a lot of Germans around this time who were saying, listen, we're not going to win the war if we're, if we're got one hand tied behind our back like this. We need to sink American vessels and any other vessels that are in their view, outfitting um, England and France uh, with armaments and foods and supplies and everything else. And so when Kiffin died, some people with, with an agenda pushed past the, the censors in Berlin the uh, story of his death and it went out in all the Berlin papers as well. And so Germany was officially bent out of shape and, and protesting to America that listen, the whole world knows that American boys are fighting in an American squadron for France. And everybody knows that Kiffin Rockwell just got shot down. And, uh, and so you need to do something about this. And um, they, they filed an official protest. And, uh, and then um, shortly after the election, when, when President uh, Wilson got reelected, um, the, the name was changed to the Volunteer Squadron, and then nobody liked that. And so then they came up with the idea, the Lafayette Squadron, the Escadrille Lafayette. And that was in December of 1916. Shortly after that, it, um, or actually in, in October of 1916, Norman Prince died. And then in March of 1917, Jim McConnell died. And by that time, the Germans had resumed unrestricted warfare. And President Wilson was under so much pressure to enter the war that uh, he finally did after these four boys had been um, shot down and the press had had their, their say of it. Well, now we get back to America's, what I would say their official entry into war. In, in April of 1916, or sorry, 1917, was when um, Congress officially de declared war um, but troops started arriving in, in late May and June and, and uh, really getting there in numbers. And then on the 4th of July of 1917, Paris officially welcomed General Pershing and the American troops. And there's some footage of this that, uh, that, that I found and a lot of photos. But um, remember, I, brought, I told you a little bit about that flag that all these boys had signed and, and that uh, Felizzo had carried around his waist and that they had carried into all these battles. Well, when Pershing showed up, they, the, the flag had made its way back to Paris now. And there was a reverend there from the American church who took that flag and brought it forward and presented it to General Pershing. And here's what he said. It is my privilege, General, as representing our American legionnaires, those Americans who for the love of France and of liberty entered the French army in 1914 to present to France this flag, their flag and our flag. They were the pioneers of that great American army, which is coming following your lead as their general. And now they, the advance guard, are leaving to you and to your troops the task which they began so bravely. Now your new standard will replace their bullet-pierced flag, whilst theirs is confided to France, whom they loved with deathless eagerness. And it will be guarded forever in that shrine of the nation, the Musée des Invalides. 
and General Pershing took the flag and everybody, you know, went, went crazy. They carried that flag with them down to the tomb of Lafayette through Paris, through the, the avenues and the boulevards with hundreds of thousands of people screaming and, and waving the American flag and cheering for the American troops as they marched through Paris. One boy who, who, had, who had just gotten over there and had signed up for the aviation squadron wrote this to his mother about the pandemonium that was going on in the streets. I never saw such a demonstration. Everywhere were American flags. Paris was wild, frantic. I never saw anything like it. They are crazy over the Americans. Viva la Amérique seems to be still buzzing in my ears. I can't begin to describe the wonderful effect our declaration of war has had on the French. It has given them new courage. We came in at the psychological moment. France weeps for happiness, cheers for joy, rekindles her spirit and cries, Viva la Marique. And uh, that was when they got to the tomb of Lafayette and General Pershing was there. Gen uh, Charles Stanton stood and gave his speech that I told you at the beginning and ended it with Lafayette, we are here. And I always thought that that was an appropriate way for America to announce its official entry into the war. Um, because these boys who were there ahead of time with no obligation to be there had done so uh, because they felt that a debt was, was owed to France. And as my book suggests, I think uh, all, all Americans owe a debt of gratitude to the boys who signed that flag, uh, to the boys who carried the flag, and, and whose uh, deeds um, uh, stood for that flag when, it, when, when their own nation would not. Um, I believe uh, as, as one gentleman who knew most of these American boys well in Paris at the time wrote that th these boys are not dead, their spirits still live, inviting us to higher ideals, nobler aspirations and unwavering patriotism. I hope that the story that I've written uh, tells their manner and uh, tells their story in a manner worthy of their sacrifice. And I thank you for your time. I'm trying to unmute myself, Mark. There, that was that was a fantastic presentation. Oh my goodness! I uh, World War One is one of my my little areas of focus, uh, and I always love hearing these stories um, that you just don't get to hear. Uh, and I can tell you for a fact that uh, French um, they they still really appreciate everything that we've done for them in the past two wars. I was in Paris uh, 90 years after this photo was taken to the date. Um, and they still celebrate the 4th of July. They still walk uh, up and down the streets with their American flags and they still are very appreciative and very thankful. Uh, so it, it's just, it's really nice to, to see this and, and to hear your story um, and, and just put all the pieces together. It just makes my job fantastic. I love what I do. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's uh, move on to some of these questions, Mark. We've got quite a few of them here for you today. Uh, the first question, oh, wait, and. Sorry, I need to screen share first before I do something else. Otherwise, nobody else can see them. Um, oh my goodness. What, was, uh, what was the French consul's reply to the Rock Road Brothers' offer to fight? Mm. Did they send a formal reply? Or, or? Yeah, I, I, I never could find a, an actual reply to them. And, and my guess is, you know, I think they sent it to the consulate in New Orleans here in America. And I never could find a, a reply there. And I had um, um, the person who had scoured the archives and found the, the, the letter for me um, look and look, you know, several times. I didn't want to, uh, you know, become a pest to her. <laughs> um, but she did check several times and there was no response. And I imagine it was probably just because there was so much going on uh, at that time in August of 1914 that they didn't have time to respond to two boys from Atlanta. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and the letter is actually printed in my book and it's, print, it's printed elsewhere too. And that's why I wanted to find it. You know, Paul, Paul Rockwell wrote Kiffin's, uh, published Kiffin's letters. And he always said that Kiffin had written this letter and he published it in his book. And, but I'd never, you can never find a copy of it. Well, eventually I tracked it down in those archives and found it. And it turned out as I had suspected, Paul actually signed the letter and he had misstated that he went to uh, Virginia Military Institute when Kiffin had, and Kiffin was the only one with military training. And I kind of suspect there was two reasons. Paul wanted to, Paul wanted to say Kiffin signed it because Kiffin was his hero after he died, you know? And he also wanted to cover his little slight fib and telling the French consulate that he had military training when he really didn't. 
That's fantastic. Um, and just to just to clarify, those letters are at which university archives? Um, it, it, at Washington and Lee has a huge trove of what they call the Rockwell papers. And that's, a, you know, I told you Paul Rockwell became a correspondent for the Chicago Daily News uh, after he left the Foreign Legion. And he kept all of Kiffin's letters. He kept letters from all the other boys. He had photographs. He had newspaper accounts. He had, you know, I mean, there's like 12 boxes of stuff that he kept. And eventually, you know, he, he, he lived until 1985 and um, he ended up donating those papers to Washington and Lee University and they're there in the archives. Um, wow, 1985, man. Yeah, he, he, he lived to be 96 years old. Uh, the next question. Uh, uh, do you know how many young men follow the Rockwells uh, by volunteering for foreign service? Approximate numbers uh, that you might've run across during your research? They, they vary pretty pretty wildly. I mean, uh, it, it, and it depends on the time, too. Um, you know, obviously, when America got into the war, there were millions that were drafted. Prior to that, uh, which is sort of my, my focus, is, you know, these guys who didn't have any obligation. And like I said, in the Foreign Legion, in the uh, uh, what they sort of called the American squad, it, it was like the ninth squad of uh, the second marching regiment of the Foreign Legion. There were 10 Americans in there. In some of the research that I did where I said that they, you know, they originally began with this American volunteer corps in Paris that was sort of recruiting volunteers. There were notes there that they were saying they had responses from 120 to 150 people and they were getting telegrams and notes and stuff from all over the place because they were publishing letters saying, hey, come, come join us, you know, fight for France. But uh, I think it was Bert Hall, who's, who's a whole nother character. He wrote in, in one of his uh, uh, pieces that, yeah, but when it came time to actually go down and, you know, go to the front, half of the boys had other things to do. And so, you know, they all disappeared. But it looks to me like about 50 or 60 actually sort of enlisted at the, at the beginning. And many came thereafter and certainly a lot volunteered in the ambulance service as well. And then over to either the Foreign Legion or aviation. It would be tough for me to put a, a, a figure on that because I would, I, I would almost surely be wrong. But the, the ones that I could definitely verify, I put a list together at the back of my book of, uh, and I call them the boys who remembered Lafayette. I know for sure that there were more than those, but the ones who I could sort of get accounts on and the guys who actually signed the flag and things like that, I think there was probably about 55 or 60. There had to be at least a few hundred that served at that time. And Paul even said later that there, there must have been, you know, a thousand or more. There's some books by some other guys. I think uh, Chris Dicon or Dicon wrote a book about uh, soldiers serving in, in France and in World War I. I think he put the number a little higher, but I, it's just hard to say. I, I, I would say it was pretty low overall before, the, before America entered the war. Uh, do you have any sense of how these American volunteers were received by the French, uh, both the civilians and the troops themselves? You did speak a little bit about that uh, at the end, uh, but maybe if you could just highlight that, just to, or touch on that just briefly. Yeah, they they were heroes. They they, they were they were especially the pilots. Um, you know, when they got those wings on their on their collar, they were the, the, the they were gods. I think strolling through Paris because uh, you know they're. They're, they're, they're wearing their, their aviators' uniforms. People were just uh, enthralled by them and, and what they could do. And then when you throw in the fact that they were American and they had no obligation to be there, they were very much, uh, th there, was, there was gratitude um, on display throughout. Um, e and even when they were in the Foreign Legion, um, you know, I mentioned Alan Seeger and his poems. I wish I could have told you that whole story, but he was a heck of a poet and a heck of a soldier. And they actually had a big uh, presentation, a big uh, ceremony on Decoration Day, which is now, uh, you know, Memorial Day uh, in May. Back then it was set as May 30th and it was called Decoration Day because you would decorate the graves of the, of the fallen soldiers. And, you, you know, you mentioned how uh, in France they adopted some of the American ways because of gratitude of this. 
this was one that they adopted. And they said in 1916, we're going to celebrate Decoration Day. And they got all these Americans together in the Place des Etats Unis in, uh, in Paris. And they had a big ceremony at the statue of Washington and uh, Lafayette, which is there. And um, they had speakers and they had all, all these people come. And Alan Seeger was supposed to give a poem there that he wrote per particularly for the occasion. And of course, the bureaucracy and the military screwed it up and, he, and they got his date wrong and he didn't get his leave. And so he missed reading his poem and he was heartbroken over it and said, you know, this poem that I wrote, it's, it's you know, they said they'll publish it in the New York Herald, but it's, it's shorn of all effect. And I've been there to that, to that place. And now they have a monument there that has Alan Seeger on top of it. And it has all the names of these boys etched in the back and, uh, and the volunteers from America. And on the uh, side of the plinth, they have the last words of his, um, his poem, which if I could find it here real quick, are pretty amazing. He said, uh, well, maybe I don't have it here. But anyway, the, the last words of his poem were pretty incredible. And um, a lot of people there can still read his his words, and it to me that that you know that that uh, memorial was put there in 1923, so just a few years after the war, and it's a good marker of what they thought of the Americans. They loved the Americans; they were grateful. The soldiers that are over there are still buried under the, the French flag and the American flag, and as you said, they still celebrate some of these holidays. And out there in Luxoy, where Kiffin is buried. They have a ceremony there every year to honor Kiffin Rockwell in oh, really? France. Yeah. No. Oh. And uh, for those of you who are interested in that poem, a quick Google search will bring it right up. Um, Alan Seeger, definitely. Yeah, Alan Seeger. It's called Ode, uh, Ode to the Americans Fallen for France or something like that. I thought I had his the last two lines of it, but I'll, I'll find that. They, they, they were pretty cool. And, and Alan Seeger was, uh, you know, he, he died right after that. He died on the 4th of July in 1916, just a few weeks after he was supposed to read that poem. And there was another big ceremony for him because uh, it's kind of fitting that he died on the 4th of July. You know, he was, um, he was, he was very pro-France pro and pro-liberty. Uh, uh, Pete Seeger's uh, uncle too, wasn't it? I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Pete Seeger was was yeah yeah he he was Pete Seeger's uncle. That's right, the famous uh, folk singer. And you can Google around and you can find um, uh, a reading of Pete Seeger reading "I Have a Rendezvous with Death," which was uh, you know Seeger's most famous poem, and that's a pretty cool um, reading as well. And if you want to find some of these things, that there's some links to some of them on my website, UndyingGreatness.com. And you'll have a slide for that at the end of this uh, to show all of our... Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Uh, we'll move on to the next question, Mark. Uh, you said that there was an African-American with the group of Paris. Uh, have you found that many African-Americans uh, signed up for uh, this kind of service before America got involved in the war? Um, not a ton, but there were some there. And there's a, there's a book that's done a lot better than mine uh, recently that somebody wrote uh, about uh, an African-American who ended up being a pilot in the squadron. And I don't focus on him again, because he, he was one of these guys that sort of came later. And um, the, the, the core group that I was most interested in was how did this start? How did this all come together? Who were the boys that were involved in that? And then a lot of people came after that. Um, and this, th this uh, African-American gentleman that I was speaking of, he was named Eugene uh, Bullard. And uh, they, uh, they, somebody just issued a book about him a year or two ago, um, which has done very well. And, uh, and, and he was a heck of a guy too. He, he, he was a boxer as well. And um, I think he did some soldiering in the Foreign Legion and then became a pilot. And there's a, a really nice story to be told there. And so I'm glad that that book was doing well. This Bob Scanlon guy was, I think he was the only African-American in, um, in their unit. And it's kind of interesting because in, in France and certainly in the Foreign Legion, you know, even though a hundred years ago, there were certainly more um, uh, d discriminatory attitudes maybe from some towards African-Americans. In the Foreign Legion, uh, 
it seemed like they all just were sort of thrown together and 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 that's the way it went and this bob scanlon guy was you know he was a big boxer and, and, and somebody called him a mountain of a man and he was this huge guy and apparently when seeger got into a fight with one of the uh 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 french or or uh, czechs or somebody in the in the foreign legion and scanlon had to come in and knock the guy out because they were gouging <laughs> gouging at uh, at Seeger's eyes and Scanlon came in and just blasted the guy and apparently he knocked it him knocked him out with one punch and Seeger sort of objected and said you know I was going to take him like a gentleman and, uh, and Scanlon said well whoever he was gouging your eyes whoever heard of a blind poet <laughs> and so but, but I didn't try I, I didn't find a lot of records of African Americans but Bob Scanlon was one and he seemed to be well liked by everybody Brothers in arms or brothers in arms. Yeah. Uh, aside from the stern finger, finger wagging uh, that the Americans got, uh, were there any other consequences uh, around the Americans fighting and violating uh, the neutrality that Wilson had set in place for us? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. The, 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 at different times, there were different uh, things going on. I guess I'd make a couple of comments about that. In August of 1914, when they were first coming together as the American Volunteer Corps, and they were recruiting people there in France, and they were trading uh, on these on these grounds, that the, and the French people were coming in and buying tickets and stuff, and cheering for them as they were marching around with, you know, their fake rifles and stuff. And um, there was a big question among some of them as they were gathering, like, can we do this? You know, America is right now declaring official neutrality. And they went to the ambassador there, um, this guy named Herrick. I th I'm drawing a blank on his name. And, um, and they went to him and said, you know, what's the deal here? Can, can, can we go forward on this? And there's a quote that, that it's in, that's in my book, and it's found other places too. But he, he later wrote in his memoirs that he told him, you know, and he said, I got down the law book from my shelf and showed him the law. And he said, but then I looked in their eyes, and that wasn't the answer they were looking for. And he said, so it was more than I could stand. And I brought my fist down on the table and I said, well, boys, that's what the law says. But by God, if I was your age and I was here, I know what I would do. And all of the boys there from the beginning said that they took that as good enough for me. And so that yeah. <laughs> they went forward on that basis. Now, it's a little dicey whether they actually were violating neutrality or not. I tend to think that they were. And if you look at the at the terms of the, um, what was it, the Hague Convention and, 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 and this, that, uh, yeah, they, I mean, they, they seem to be pretty clearly within those, those terms. But, you know, I mentioned those three boys that went back for their Christmas leave, uh, you know, Norman Prince and Elliot Cowden and William Thaw. And the, uh, the, the editor of the Fatherland newspaper, that George Virick, who filed these complaints with the State Department, I dug up sort of their internal communications there about that. And they didn't want to deal with it. They didn't want to face it. But they ultimately came to the conclusion through this, um, I can't remember what they called it, some sort of board that they had constituted. And that board reached the opinion that, no, they're not really violating neutrality at all because uh, they're not wearing their uniform. They're, they're not carrying a weapon. And they're only here for Christmas, by the way, which to me seemed like... <laughs> Yeah. But they just sort of washed their hands of the whole thing and, and let it go. Um, so they, they didn't have any consequences. But when I was looking that up for some of these guys, there were a bunch of these determinations uh, for people joining the Canadian forces, for people signing up with England, and for France. And there were various complaints raised at various times. And the, the, the board was sort of taking that stance that they weren't really violating uh, neutrality. But I think that was sort of uh, just a, you know, the, the, the force of will more than, than the force of law. They were just saying, yeah, yeah well, we're not stepping in the middle of that. And <laughs> they didn't. Well, you're a lawyer, so we'll, we'll take your interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I were choosing sides on the legal interpretation of it, I probably would have chosen uh, the side that they were in violation. If, if but... I, well, probably I would have fallen the same place as the ambassador and said, that's what the law says, boys, but I know. What I'm doing. <laughs> uh, since Kiffin died before uh, we became involved in the war, did, this, did that have any negative impact on his service record or his memory here in the U.S.? Um, 
Well, I, I don't know what you mean exactly by ser service record. I, I, I would say um, no, because uh, he's, he's a hero in France, and that's, that's whose service record matters. That's the only place he, he served was in the, uh, you know, the French Foreign Legion and then uh, th through the uh, uh, French Aviation Service. Um, and There's there no posthumous awards of AEF medals or expeditionary medals or, or anything like that, though? Um, I, I, I don't know about the AEF. He did accumulate a lot of, of, of French war medals. He won the Croix de Guerre. Um, he won several palms for his Croix de Guerre. He, he won the, uh, the uh, Medal Militaire, which was the highest honor. And uh, he, he had become, uh, he had just been proposed for lieutenant right before he got shot down for, he, he, he got his fourth victory and had just been proposed for lieutenant and then got shot down before he got the, the uh, commission. Um, but he was certainly viewed as a, as a hero, as, as were all these boys. And I think later on, a lot of the, when the Americans came in, they took on a lot of these, uh, the, these boys and these pilots in particular, many of them from this squadron became sort of the instructors and the leaders for what would eventually become the American Air Force. Guys like Bill Thaw, who, who was transferred into the, uh, the American side of things and was a major and uh, and and led hit led a squadron straight through the end of the end of the war. And Raoul Luffberry, who I didn't mention yet, but he was he had the most kills of any American pilot. And, but but in my view, he was he was you know more French than American. He he had just been in America for a while. But he when when America entered the war, he went with an American. Um, he went with the American uh, army and um, led a squadron as well. I think he became a major as well. So the Americans certainly wanted these guys to come in. And remember, before America entered the war, there was a lot of people in America that were saying, pre preaching this gospel of preparedness. You know, we need to be prepared. We need to get planes. We need pilots. We need ships. We need men. And unfortunately, none of it was really listened to because when we entered the war, we didn't have anything. And that's why it took us so long to, to really get going over there. Most of 1917 was just a wash even after we got in. But I did come across a couple things in my research. There was one in particular that stands out where there was some uh, uh, American colonels or something that were trying to scrape together the backbone of an American uh, aviation, uh, you know, aviation service. And they actually wrote notes saying, we want these guys, we want Rockwell, we want Chapman, we want Prince and and they didn't even know they wrote it in like February. They didn't even know that Rockwell had died. With how 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 uh, oblivious they were to what was going on, and the, you know the American people knew Kiffin Rockwell had already died. His own government didn't know it and was still planning on him coming in to lead the American forces there now. And um, I guess that shows sort of how un unprepared um, America was when it finally did. Uh, get into the war. But as far as their service records, I don't think America looked down on them. There was actually one boy, uh, Edmund, Edmund Genet, who deserted the Navy and went to France. And I think like Pershing him a posthumous award or something, and, or the, 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 the general over the Navy after the fact, because Genet died, he was the first pilot to die after America entered the war. And they gave him an award, an American award. And, uh, sort of uh, said, that's okay that he deserted the Navy. He was where he needed to be. Uh, and the last question mark, I didn't make it into the, the PowerPoint. Uh, I was slid in right at the end. Uh, but one of our audience members wants to know what happened to Paul? Uh, did he stay in Paris after the war, throughout the war? Yeah? Yeah, he stayed there. And, and like I said, he became a correspondent. He met, uh, he, he ended up in a chateau that had been turned into a hospital. And his nurse was actually the daughter of the guy who owned the chateau, who was a very wealthy Frenchman in French government and later became the prime minister of France and was huge, hugely influential and hugely wealthy. Paul and the daughter hit it off when she was sort of taking care of him as his nurse and they got engaged and um, they were engaged through most of that time and after Kiffin died, he finally got married. And I think that he, I think that Kiffin's death had some impact on that where he thought, you know what, I, I should have gotten married before Kiffin died. 
he got married to her. Um, he stayed in France for a number of years. They had uh, uh, a child and then they came back to America and he, they eventually got divorced and she went back to France. He remarried in America and he spent most of the rest of his life living in Asheville, North Carolina, um, which is where he and Kiffin had one of the areas where they had grown up. And uh, they still have, they have a marker out there in Asheville. They have the home where he, where they grew up is still uh, standing. I think a lawyer out there owns it. And um, Paul spent most of the rest of his life writing and about Kiffin <laughs> mainly. Um, and he, he wrote a book uh, called The American Volunteers in, in France. He published Kiffin's letters and he did a lot of writing for different magazines and whatnot but he was pretty wealthy now and um, he, he had a lot of different causes that he, uh, that he advocated for. But the biggest cause of all for him was these American boys and particularly Kiffin. And at the time well, Mark, he lived to be 96 years old and didn't, uh, died in 1985. Well, we definitely appreciate you coming on with us today and, and all the research, research that you've done on this topic. Uh, and particularly these two brothers, Kiffin, uh, you know, for sure. Um, we always love to hear about these little uh, facets of military history uh, that kind of, you know, no pun intended, fly under the radar. Um, and just just the fact that you you took it, take, take, taking your time, um, you know, went out and did this research, did all your travels, and put this great book together. Uh, thanks so much. We, we definitely appreciate it. And then coming out and talking to us today, uh, we always, always welcome that. Oh, it's, it's my favorite thing. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Oh, no, no problem. Anytime, anytime. Uh, and for those of you uh, who joined us today, thanks so much. Uh, we hope you have a great uh, rest of your Monday. Uh, please go to wispetsmuseum.com. Uh, check out our event schedule. Uh, we've got trivia coming up next week. We've also got drink and draw coming up this week uh, with a guest artist. Uh, so please look at our event schedule. And uh, hopefully we'll see you back here for more virtual events at the museum, if not in person at the museum itself. Uh, again, Mark, thank you. Thanks to everybody out there in the audience and uh, we'll see you next time.